And something we know is that men, uh, men over 85 have the highest rate of suicide in, in Australia. But a lot, not a lot of is known about why that is. And probably the key person that's actually spent some time wrestling with that question is uh, Dr. Kylie King. And I always get her university wrong because she's all over the place. She's been at Monash and she's been at the University of Melbourne. I'll allow her to tell you where she is now. Um, and I had the, uh, the, the privilege to be on the community reference group of a piece of research that uh, uh, Kylie did into older male suicide. And I'm delighted that she's here to share some of her, her knowledge and take some questions from you. I'll just uh, hand over the mic and the, uh, and the floor to you, you, you Kylie. You've got as uh, much time as you need for the next 30 minutes to, um, to, uh, to share your uh, findings and your insights with us. Um, Great. Thanks, Glenn. Hello. Yeah, though, no, thanks for having me. I've, right. just, I've just dipped in now and I'll stay for the rest of the afternoon, but it's looking like it's been a great day already, so great to be a part of it. So, yeah, I'm at Monash Uni now. I started there like the end of last year and I was at Melbourne Uni for about 10 years before that. So my research is in suicide prevention and mostly in, with a focus on boys and men. And as part of that, I've done some work looking at suicide by our older men aged over 85 who, as Glenn said, have the highest rate of suicide um, by age or gender group in Australia. So I will share my screen with you because I've got a bit of a presentation to give you. If I can do this. There it is. If I can get the slideshow going. There we go. So yeah, we were interested to understand more about why the suicide rate is so much higher amongst men aged over 85. There hasn't been a lot of research done about this and um, we were really keen to try to understand more about it. Oh my goodness, I've got a beeping in the background. No, it's stopped. Good. <laughs> so as Glenn said, um, whilst we do see um, greater numbers of suicides by men in other age groups, when we look at the um, standardised rate of suicide, so that's the rate per 100,000 people, we see that the rate is highest amongst those men aged over 85. And it's actually six times higher than women in that age group. So the differential between men and women is also the highest amongst that age group. So there has been a bit of research into suicide by older people, and that's looked at a various range of factors that are associated by, with suicide. So obviously social factors are key, such as um, isol social isolation, psychological factors, such as mental health problems, physical factors, such as physical illness and chronic pain, functional factors, such as cognitive de decline, and um, gendered factors such as the social cultural context of suicide. But unfortunately, this research doesn't tell us still a lot about why suicide is higher amongst older men for a couple of reasons. A, lo a lot of this research is focused on people over age 65 and not specifically on people aged over 85. And a lot of the research has also not compared, looked at men and women. And also the other issue we have is we're unsure whether some of these factors are just present in all people aged over 85 or all people over age 65 and whether they are unique, uniquely related to suicide, we're not sure. Um, there is a lot of debate about why in general the rate of suicide is higher amongst men um, for, of all ages. So for instance, that discourse has talked about, you know, the fact that men use more lethal means, can be more socially isolated, can have reduced help seeking. But again, it's still not telling us why it is that our older men aged over 85 have such a, a high rate compared to other men and also women their own age. So this is what we're trying to understand. So we um, got a little bit of money to do a pilot study when I was at the University of Melbourne. And we were really interested to know what role does this generation's masculinity play in their suicidality? So we wanted to know about, well, we can see the rates much higher amongst men. So what is it about being a man that places this um, group of men at much higher risk of suicide. We also wanted to try to start to think about what suicide pre prevention interventions might work with men over 85, because there's um, very little in, um, research about suicide preventions with that age group. And also we wanted to work out a little bit more about if we were gonna do a bigger project, what research methods might work. So masculinity, just to tell you a bit about where we're coming from. So when we talk about masculinity, we think about the masculine norms 
in society. So the script by which society tells men to live their life. So it's a socially constructed gender ideal, if you like. And you could argue that the dominant masculinity in Australia is one that endorses the norm. So encourages men to be stoic, independent, invulnerable and avoid negative feelings. But unfortunately, we know that, that, that those aspects of masculinity have been associated with suicidality, reduced help seeking and other negative mental health outcomes. But no study has looked at the link between what it is to be a man and suicide in our oldest men. So we were interested in that. Getting back to that question of, like I said, what, what is it about being an older man that places them at such higher risk compared to other men there, other younger men and other women? So we did a small qualitative study where we did some focus groups with older men and we also offered the option of phone interviews and surveys. But surprisingly to us, the men were quite keen to take part in the focus groups. People told us the older men aren't gonna to wanna to talk about this, but they did and they came along to focus groups. We had 33 men aged between 80 to 92. Most were born in Australia. Most spoke English at home. Most were still living at home. And most of them rated their health as very good or excellent or good, which was surprising to us because a lot of people came along on, you know, we had a few people on walking frames. We had a few people tell us that they had various cancers, but they were still rating their health as good or very good. So we asked questions around well-being and ageing, the challenges they were experiencing, their physical health, their social support, and um, ideas about um, their ideas about suicide and suicide prevention. So we didn't specifically ask them about masculinity or gender roles, but we did at times ask them about, you know, well, how might that be different for men or how might that be different for women, just to sort of get at that question. So um, we, Kate, we found a few themes in our um, focus groups and interviews, and I was going to talk through some of those with you now. It is hard to do all of this justice in a, in a brief Zoom presentation, so please get in touch with me afterwards if you want to talk about the study more. I'd always love to have a chat about it. So the first thing um, that men told us about was the problems that they were facing. They talked to us about their functional and um, physical health. They talked to us about the regard in which we were held. They talked to us about a fear of running out of money, about loneliness and loss of friends, the struggle with using technology. And a few men also spoke to us about how they were looking after their wives and how this had been quite difficult for them. So I'll let you read through a lot of the, the quotes there because I don't have enough time to do it. But you can see some key ones there like, you know, if you took driving away from me, it'd be like chopping my legs off. And loneliness is the big one. You lose your partner and you're dead. So they also spoke to us about what's important. And the biggest theme that came through here was the importance of staying alive. And staying alive was achieved by staying, staying active. As um, one guy said here, I found that some friends have given up living because it's, so, it's hard to keep active and so have died. So the thinking was that if they didn't keep active, this might hasten their death. So they also spoke about the importance of good health. And again, a lot of um, activities were taken in, up in that pursuit. They also spoke to us about the, the value of a positive mental health attitudes. So as um, one guy said, everyone has one or two traumas in their life and it's just a matter of being big and tough enough to get through it. They also spoke a lot about the value of people. They spoke about partners, um, children and grandchildren and they spoke very warmly. Like this guy said, he said, after the job I did all they're my bit of sanctuary. So then we um, have two things here about masculine approaches to living and masculine approaches to dying and suicide. So men actually, like I said, we didn't ask directly about you know, gender roles or masculinity or what it was to be a man, but the men started talking like really um, early in the focus groups and quite openly about the roles that they played in their lives. So they talked about their roles of being male providers and decision makers. So as this guy said, um, my wife stayed at home, brought up the two boys and I more or less made the decision and it's just gone on and will go on because it's in us to do it. And you know, this other guy said, um, the other thing is you don't tend to share it because you make the decisions all the time and you reckon, well, that's my job, I've got to do it. So they also spoke about the way they did their relationships. And again, they were quite, 
open and articulate and had a bit of a laugh at themselves about this. And they told us that, you know, women just do it so much better. We've got lots of acquaintances, you know, and these were, a lot of these men were attending men's shed and we actually spoke to them in men's shed, some of them. And like this guy said, I've got 175 members here and they're all acquaintances. So they were surrounded by people. But a close friend is entirely different where a woman seems to have this all the time and have closer communications than what we have. So then we started talking to them about um, suicide and we've called this the masculine approaches to dying and suicide. So it was really interesting actually because they didn't really see suicide by an older man as a suicide. They saw it as a right to die when they wanted and how they wanted. So I think this quote on the right is just really sums it up. So when I was young, as you know, suicide was a crime. If you tried to suicide and you recovered, you went to jail, you know. I was brought up suicide was the cardinal sin, unforgivable and all this sort of stuff. So I'm not, can't imagine myself ever wanting to do it like suicide, unless you know I was in that much pain and so forth, you know. Fortunately now there's euthanasia that hopefully would absolve you of having to do that. So it was seen as entirely different from suicide. Some of them spoke about times earlier in their life as a younger man when they'd um, gone through periods of their life and they thought about suicide in relation to, you know, life stress, but they saw that as, as really different. And they even used that kind of old language around, you know, a coward's way out and being a sin, but this was entirely different from what they were thinking about now. And they had, many of the men had a very strong opinion about their right to die. So there should only be one person with the right to decide when I die, how I die, where I die. So it was seen um, quite differently. And I should say too that, as I said, a lot of people said to us, um, men, are, they're not going to talk to you about this. But they did and they were very open about it. And there was a couple of men that actually talked about times when they were feeling suicidal earlier in life. And they said to us, I'd never spoken about that before. So giving them the opportunity to talk about it, I think was um, fantastic. So they also spoke to us about the reasons for suicide. We said to them, you know, the rate is so much higher amongst um, men your age compared to women. Why do you think that is? And they spoke about um, what would happen if their, their health and functioning become further compromised. And they were very concerned about not wanting to be a burden on other people. So as this guy said, you might feel your family is better off without you financially or physically, just being a realist or if you suffer a lot of complaints, is life worth living? They also spoke about the loss of their partner, how, how this could be a really a critical event. Although having said that, there were a few men in the group that had lost their partners and, and were doing quite well, but a lot of the men agreed that this can be a, a big trigger for, for men. They talked about how they, you know, that sometimes a lot of the, the men's partners were doing a lot in terms of, um, you know, housework and, and looking after them and driving. And all of a sudden, if a partner's gone, that sometimes they've noticed in other men that this means they can rapidly go downhill. They also spoke about um, nursing homes. And some men even said that they would consider ending their lives to avoid going to a nursing home. So as this guy said, if you can offer me a better alternative, I'd be happy not to commit suicide. But nobody at that moment offers me an alternative that I want. And they also spoke about the, the importance of connection with other men. So if I came down and had a yarn with the blokes at the shed, I'd probably be all right. But it's important to um, remember that earlier when talking about the results, I was telling you about how, um, oh, actually, maybe I forgot to mention that now that I'm looking at it. Let me see. Oh, no, they said that women do relationships a lot better. So they talked to us about how as they got older, it was harder to initiate and develop um, close relationships with other people. And um, so that social isolation was really important. And so we can see now that um, as we're talking about dying and suicide, that that social connection is really important, but something that they struggled to, to do on their own. A lot of men were telling us how they relied heavily on structured social activities, such as the men shared, and other groups and clubs they belong to. And there was very few instances of sort of social, what, what I'd call kind of social casualized, social casual contact. So they spoke about how, you know, women all have a chat over the fence. Women all strike up a friendship at the doctors, mm -hmm. but men don't do that casual socialization. So they relied heavily on that structured social activity. Yeah. 
So um, implications for suicide prevention. So I think we've learned here that the um, deterioration in independence is obviously a really important thing for men of this age, that they don't want to be a burden on others and they want to avoid nursing homes. Also the connection to people, so loss of a partner and loneliness and isolation is a possible risk factor, which is further compounded by um, what the men told us about the difficulties they had in forming sort of close and meaningful relations with people. We actually asked many in the group, one of the questions we had was, who would you talk to if you had an you know, emotional, personal problem? And um, we just found it really hard for the men to answer that. And we had to ask it in lots of different ways. Or, you know, like if you were stressed or if you had something on your mind or if something was worrying you. And they really just couldn't answer it. They kind of looked at us blankly. So this connection to people is something that they, they really value but perhaps need a little bit of help to make happen. We also thought that it's probably important for um, health professionals to look out for lack of activity or purpose as perhaps a red flag for older men rather than sadness. So the men didn't talk to us about feeling sad or emotional, but they spoke to us about lack of activity or purpose. They spoke about how it was so important to have a reason to get up in the morning and something to do. And if they didn't have that, if they had deterioration in that independent of functioning, then that's when things would start to look dire for them. I think it's important also to highlight the, the role of older men who care for their partners, because that was a, a quite a stressful role for the men that we spoke to. And the impact of the gender roles is really interesting. If we come back to our question of the, at the beginning of, you know, what it is about, <coughs> excuse me, what it is about being a man that makes this time of life more challenging perhaps than it is for women. And if we come back to the beginning when we're thinking about how um, independence and self-reliance are kind of a bit of a cornerstone of what it means to be a man, especially what it means to be an older man, that the challenges of ageing can really threaten that. And it can also make it difficult because they've had these um, roles in their life that have revolved around work and forming relationships and friendships through work. And then as they get older, just because they haven't had that experience in casual socialisation, there's some difficulties making and sustaining close relationships. So in terms of interventions, obviously it's really important to target these key areas and these times of stress that we've identified to focus on maintaining purpose and activity. GPs are really trusted, I didn't mention that before, but they each, when we asked who did you talk to, the one person they um, consistently mentioned was GPs. Structured social activities are so important and we're also wondering now about whether um, keeping in mind this kind of idea of independence and self-reliance, whether there might be an opportunity to work with older men to help kind of normalise challenges, to break open the kind of awareness that, that you know, lots of um, men are struggling with this as they're ageing and hopefully that might lessen some stigma around the challenges associated with reduced independence. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. So just wanted to acknowledge all our supporters of our research. Our study partners were the National Ageing Research Institute, the Australian Men's Shared Association helped us. And on our advisory group, we had um, Gary Green, who was with the Australian Men's Shared Association. Glenn helped us out. We had Andrea from the Positive Ageing Reference Group at Monash and Alan Woodward. And like I said, I certainly didn't get through it all today. So I'd really love you to get in touch with me. Always happy to have a chat about the study and the other work that we're doing. So that's it for me, Glenn. Now I need to stop my sharing. Thanks, thanks, Kylie. Um, wonderful piece of work you've done there, and it really is like starting a conversation rather than completing a conversation. But it's a really important yeah. conversation you, you've started. I'm really interested to hear from um, some of the people in the room, particularly um, those who haven't had a chance to speak yet. You know, maybe someone who hasn't been a speaker or hasn't spoken out. Um, you know, any thoughts you have, but also, of course, any questions for Kylie, or, or, or we only have for a, a limited time, so a limited amount of time. So, you know, you know the score by now, go into the participants box and um, click participants icon, click on there. Ken, I'll let you go as you got your hand up first, Ken. Um, and if you've, can, you have a go. This is Ken from the Omni Group. Enjoyed that very much, Kylie. Oh, Thanks great, again. Ken. Um, I'm 82. I think I'm probably the oldest person attending today. If there's anyone older, I'd like to hear about it. <laughs> I'm right on that, on, on that brink of, uh, um, I'm going to go soon. Uh, you know, I've, got, I've got enough problems to uh, 
not bother the next time I have another heart attack <laughs> to ring triple zero. Uh, I don't know if that's suicide or not, but I'm very much in favour of um, uh, euthanasia on demand. And I, I, I believe, I, ha I think, that if we had a euthanasia on demand for men over 80, you'd see more of them applying for it so that you could then have some form of intervention to see what the problems were. Mm. Anyway, I've got a paper on that. If you want a copy, I'll email it to you. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I'm really interested in that intersection with the assisted dying. Like when we did this study that hadn't quite got into legislation yet, now it is, but the older men obviously knew it was on the cards and that played into the discussion. But um, yeah, it is very interesting because it still does worry me though that um, older men are making the decision to end their life at that much higher rate than women, you know, and, I, and there's obviously some questions there about, pardon? Oh, you're still, mute, you're still muted, Ken. <clears throat> I, I'd, I'd like to suggest that it's okay that they mm -hmm. take their own lives because there are no other channels for them to end the suffering that they're feeling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know of a number of suicides. Uh, within the family, my mother's sister <coughs> filled up the bathtub and put her head under when the kids told her that she was going into a nursing home. Oh, dear. Uh, I, I didn't, never ever met this other very distant member of the family who... Uh, after his wife died, walked into the dam with his shotgun and blew his head off. Oh, goodness. And he was, he was very old. But I also know some um, younger suicides uh, that I've known personally. It's mm. pretty sad. It is very sad. Because they didn't need to suicide in my view. Yeah. But one was a lady who was bipolar and stopped taking her medication. But um, I loved her very much. But... Um, Anyway, uh, thank you again. Enjoyed it very much. Thank so you, your, Ken. Your, your email is kylie.king at monash.ed.au? Just, just .edu. No au. Monash.edu. Thank you. Thanks, Hi. Ken. If I could just jump in Briefly, Kylie, there. I think it's uh, this is a really important conversation that people there's a, there's a real stigma around this part of the conversation. But when you get into a room where it's men over men over 65, it's pretty much always one of the first points that come up. And I think you know, now it's particularly, particularly now we've got some states with, with this legislation, we really need to lean into this conversation, yeah, and, yeah, in all its complexity. Uh, and and really work through it, and really, I think it deserves an entire session in itself. Um, yeah. But I'm really interested to hear how many any any thoughts or reflections that you have that you've picked up, because no doubt you've 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 run into this part of the conversation yourself uh, before doing this research. Yeah, we we did. I mean, we tried to stay away from it a little bit because it's a little bit of a different discussion. But um, yeah, I really do think it's a conversation that needs to happen, and it's not really happening. It's about, and I, I take Ken's point that, you know, I think people are entitled to make decisions about the way that their life ends, but it does worry me that older men are making that choice at a much higher rate. And I worry that that speaks to um, a feeling that they might have about the worth of their life. And so, and that's what, that's what worries me. And I suppose what we learned is that older men were perhaps struggling with, um, you know, reduced independence and reduced functionality. And perhaps that was particularly challenging for them in a way that, it might not be as challenging for women who are able to maintain the social role that they had through their lives as they get older. So I think there's a discussion that needs to be had there about the value and worth of older men's lives. Yeah. And I think for me, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm working this out as I go along myself because I don't feel, I don't feel like I've fully explored this part of the conversation fully enough to have arrived at a, a settled position. Yeah. But my starting point is something in mapping it out. Is, is there something like, there's the suicide is, is, is so often preventable uh, which mm. we know from talking to people who've come out on the other side of an attempt. Um, and there's this world of how, whatever language we use of where suicide is seen as being, as being a rational choice, for example, sometimes. Yes. An rational. interesting phrase. Isn't, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, irrational. And I'd, ha I'd hate to be <laughs> sort of like trying to define irrational and rational suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the, if those are sort of two, 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 two marking points, I think what's really interesting then is how we explore the grey area in between. Mm. It, doesn't just, it doesn't just break into those two groups of... Exactly, 
exactly. Most people, when they attempt suicide, for them at that point is entirely rational. But then exactly. often if they don't succeed and they look back, they go, well, I'm so glad that I didn't, uh, didn't complete the suicide. Yeah. Not like the, the right thing to do at the time, but looking back, I'm so glad I've had the second chance. So there's a, there's a lot to sort of balance and unpick there in that gray area, I think. Absolutely. And rational for who? You know, I think it's easy for us as a society to go, oh, well, you know, he was 90. He had a good life, you know, off he goes, you know, but I don't know. And we, we've also done some extra work where we're looking at coroner's data, Victorian coroner's data for um, suicide deaths by older men and comparing them to older women and younger men. But what struck me when I um, did that work is I went to the coroner's court and read through all the case files about men over 85 who had died by suicide, which, you, you know, it was an uplifting day. But anyway, but what struck me about that when I read through all the cases is that these, a lot of the men that were dying by suicide were dying for the same reasons that men of any age would die by suicide. You know, they were distressed, they're having family, you know, relationship problems with their families. They had long-standing, you know, perhaps mental health problems and they were, you know, in moments of despair and loneliness and, a lot of the same factors that we see in suicides across the lifespan and in women as well. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, it's complicated, isn't it? It's complicated and, and it's great that we, we have, where people feel able to raise it here and talk about it, which is, you know, one of the things we want to do around suicide is make it easier for people to talk about. Yeah, and, yeah. And not to create a whole load of new stigma about which parts of suicide we can and can't talk about. So, yeah. Ken, Ken, thanks for raising it. It's a really important part of the conversation. Um, has anyone else got a question or a, a comment? Um, wave, wave your hand physically or wave your hand in the, um, in the participants box. Okay. All right, well, we've got, um, looks like, is anything else you want to just share with us before we, um, we, we let you go, Kylie? Oh, look, I'd love people to get in touch if they want to talk about it more. But, um, yeah, the coroner's study that we're doing, which is just a little study, but interestingly, the kind of things we're seeing in there is we were interested to see whether older men, you know, are they having more physical health problems? Are they having more physical pain? Have they got more life stresses? Or is there something going on that explains this higher risk? And what we're seeing is that there isn't really, you know, it doesn't come down to they're not having more life stresses. They're not in more physical and they're not having more physical illness and in fact they've got a lot lower um there was a lot lower presence of mental health problems compared to younger men and a lot less um, mental health treatment going on as well right. so that raises some interesting questions too about whether suicide is driven by other factors perhaps yeah. or perhaps mental health concerns aren't being picked up in this age older age group and perhaps they're not getting the treatment they need yeah so yeah yeah and for me i think you know with that suicide prevention piece um, with older men, one of the one of the areas we tend to look at is how do we improve the mental health care, and how do we uh, reach more older people through, say, like daycare settings and things like that. And those are two places where you'll see less older men. You'll see less older men in daycare settings, and you'll see less older men in in in, in existing mental health treatment. And yeah, so we also need to be a bit smarter about where we try and yeah. engage with, with older men around this. Yeah. Um, That's a good point, Glenn. And I should raise too that we didn't get to speak to probably the really men that we really should have spoken to, which were men that were at home, men that weren't coming to men's sheds, men that are in nursing homes or in supported care. So we didn't get to speak to those men, but we would really love to upscale this project and speak to a diverse a range of older men. Yeah, excellent. It's an excellent piece of work, Kylie. And it was um, oh, thank you. great to have some involvement um, working, some small involvement working working with you um and one of the things that came out of it for for me I, I have a couple of hats one of the hats i wear is i run um a project called the stop male suicide project um mostly focused on um on training people how to how to engage with men people in the community so not from the clinical end but more like at a, a kind of a shared or if you know and if you've got someone in your family or your workplace um and we've just got a bit of funding through that in the hunt new england and central coast area oh, fantastic a project focused specifically on older men in that primary health network area just got put on hold a bit because of covid um we can't be going into loads of sheds and care homes and things and doing stuff but that's 
over a 12 month period going to enable us to, and we use your research to mm. actually make, make the, because they were looking for projects that, that targeted older people. And, and then we made the case that actually you, you want to target old, older people. Yeah. So then our focus is on reaching the people who are connected to the older men who may be at risk of. Mm. Mm. So, that's the, so we're running that over 12 months and your research will come in very handy. And, and so anyone who's got, you know, thoughts or insights or interest in, the, in this male suicide conversation, including that very important part of the conversation we were just unpicking there a bit with, with, with Ken, and I'll pop, up, pop in the details for me there, as opposed to the Australian Men's Health Forum, which you can share with me, because that's a real, really looking forward over 12 months to, to thinking more deeply about how mm. we can prevent suicide in, um, in older men. Um, so great to see you, Kylie. Thanks for being Thanks, here. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for having me. That's all really exciting yeah. to hear about all the work that's happening. Yeah, you're very welcome. And it's been a great contribution to the day. And it fit nicely into us having sort of Louise mm. at the moment, uh, just before you. Yeah. Um, and then our next speaker also sort of fits uh, into a different part of this conversation. I'll say goodbye, Kylie. Thank you so much. Bye. I'm, I'm